Three ounces. Yes. They will talk about the basic comparison topics for the online professional development. Yes. So it's a completely different setting. So forget everything Colin told you. <laughs> Not. We'll go for something completely different. Um, I'm from the University Colleges Leuven Limburg in Belgium. Um, and I headed two projects which developed online learning for teachers in secondary education and primary education. So what I'll do is I'll talk about the context a bit because it's a quite different context than you might be used to. Talk about the two different postgraduate certif certificates that we developed and then look into the educational designs for both of these and do a compare and con contrast. Um, and then leave some time for Q&A. So Belgium is complex. We have French speaking, Flemish speaking, German speaking. I'm talking about the north part of the country where we speak Flemish, our version of Dutch. About 7 million people, compulsory education from the ages of five to 18 and divided into primary and secondary education, five to 12, 12 to 18. If you're interested, there's a, a bitly link about education in Flanders. The schools are either certified by the state or they're not. Those that are certified are also financed by the state and the teachers are paid immediately through the state. So it's not the school that, pay, that pays the teachers, it's the state that pays the teachers. And it's the state that de de defines how many teachers can be applied, employed based on the number of students. Um, since 2021, the state has also decided to pay educational technologists before they had to be paid out of whatever means the school was able to scramble together and ask some teachers to leave to not teach a few hours but be engaged with education technology and the state decided that they needed two types of staff to support teachers in educational technology they needed the ict coordinator which is the technical person who does all the networking in schools, who does all the handling of uh, iPads or laptops, and they needed a pedagogical ICT coordinator. So the state defined two sets of qualifications for teachers or staff that want to take this role within the school. And what the state also did was look at what kind of competencies do you need as an ICT coordinator? So it defined between technical tasks, pedagogical tasks, policy and vision, and administrative tasks. So you can see here all the kind of things that fall underneath these four categories of tasks. And then they said, well, the function of pedagogical ICT coordinator looks mainly at technical basis and then the pedagogical basis. They need to have some knowledge of vision and uh, policy and a bit of administrative skills. Whereas the technical ICT coordinator is supposed to look at the technical and the administrative stuff. So um, user management within the VLE, that kind of stuff. So the state has definitely decided there are two types of functions, two types of roles within a school for ICT support staff. And based on that, we developed two separate postgraduate degrees because they're quite different roles that people need to take up. Um, we're not the only University of Applied Science who does that. So there's four others who do postgraduate certificate on pedagogical ICT coordination and three others who do technical ICT coordination. It used to be two more. So two schools already decided to stop offering this postgraduate degree. I'll come back to that later. So we developed two programs um, and we had a number of common goals within the university. So one was a practice oriented professional development. The other was flexibility in time and place. Autonomy and self-directed learning because this, these are professionals who do this during their working hours, during their family time. Um, and if possible, make use of existing course materials because we also offer students in secondary education, the, the a program directed towards ICT 
in schools. And so we decided to look into whether these existing materials could be reused. So we developed two different online programs. The first one is on the waste technologue, which means uh, educational technologist. And the second one is technical ICT coordinator. They're both at postgraduate level. We don't enforce that. So people don't have to have a graduate degree, but that's, you know, administratively, that was the easiest to handle. A part-time program. Uh, 22 to 24 ECTS, you know, the term ECTS, European Credit System. Um, so the full course load is between 550 and 700 study hours. A full one year program for a new student is 60 ECTS. So that can, you can compare that as you know, one third of a full load of study. Um, but also, some of the participants decide to take only some modules and not the whole program. So we're quite flexible in that. Um, they're not usually after the degree that they get at the end. They're looking for professional development, whether it's for the whole course or just part of it. Um, they combine it, as I said, with jobs and family. And we expect the workload to be 15 to 20 hours a week, which is quite a lot if you are employed and have a young family. So what we wanted to do was make the, the assignments as close as possible to the tasks that they fulfill within their school so that they don't have to take that you know, mental distance from the work that they're doing. We try to have the assignments as close as possible to their regular tasks. So these are the, the curricula for the two programs. As you see, both have policy issues at the top. So that's a joint course. And both also have ethical and legal issues at the bottom which is also a joint course, and all the rest are different modules. I'll leave that up there for a minute. So as you see, the one educational technologist is mainly about pedagogy, didactics, you know, supporting teaching, supporting learning with ICT, coaching stakeholders. Um, that's usually parents in secondary education, fellow teachers. Whereas the technical ICT coordinator is a much more technical program. It's about computer systems. It's about networking, um, system management, security, web design. So it's a quite different kettle of fish. And so we chose two quite different educational designs as well. Um, technical ICT coordinator started from existing ICT campus classes that were being taught to 18 to 20 year old students on campus in a hybrid room and they would be streamed towards those people who were not at location. So, and they would be recorded so they could look at them later on. The VLE functions as a learning guide. The class recordings are available, learning materials are available, exercises and assignments. And the learning principle is individual learning. So when you're ready, when you have the time, look at the re recorded lecture, do the exercises, the results of the exercises are sent to the coach and the coach goes into individual feedback mode. So he gives you, and, and the coaches reported that they would often be working from 10 to midnight on days of the week because that's when the students were learning. Whereas the approach for the education technologist was quite different. We decided to start from scratch, not look at anything that was available, but look, focus on the group of learners. So the expert learners who already are working in that area and who can share experiences with each other. So the learning principle was a network learning, sharing of experience and cases. And the, the guideline throughout the program was Tuesday evening when we would have a synchronous session from seven to nine in the evening, uh, live and recorded. So those who were there could contribute. Those who weren't there could contribute later on in discussion fora on Teams. Um, so the learning environments were quite similar, but the one on technology, the educational technologist was much more focused on group learning and sharing. So the Teams environment was the place to be, whereas in the other course, the VLE was the place to be. There's hardly any sharing between students within that group. Assessment is similar. So it's tutor marked assignments. There's no exam. 
at the end. We didn't feel that was, you know, very valuable for those for that target group to have exams. So we made up assignments that were close as possible to their daily practice. Um, flexible deadlines, which means that towards the end of June, when exams start in secondary education, they don't have time to do the assignments. They take the summer holidays to do. Um, we had synchronous classes, as said, in the first group, so the educational technologist on Tuesday, that would be either the tutor or an invited speaker. Whereas the other group had only synchronous classes as joint feedback moments. So there was no real content offered within the synchronous classes. These were quite similar, asynchronous tutoring. Um, but it turned out that where we had the situation of individual learners, there was a lot more email being sent back and forth. In the group situation, there was a lot of team channels being used for discussion. So they, did, they didn't fully rely on the tutor to give feedback. They relied on each other to give feedback. Um, the teacher mindset in both cases were quite similar. So whereas as a coach, a tutor, a motivator, but the first group would look at the network and the group and try to motivate the group instead of the individual. Um, of course, we looked at quality assurance. This program has run for two years now. I forgot to say that. Um, so after every run, every semester, we would run the course. Um, the teachers would ask participants for feedback and then adapt the courses based on that feedback. So the four runs that we've had so far are completely different from the one that we started with is completely different than the current one. Um, so we used online survey focus groups um, and also just during the course, people would give feedback, you know, this session last week was really worthless. Let's not repeat that. It's quite confronting for teachers to some two of my teachers said, you know, in December last year, I, I don't want to do this anymore because they're so critical and anything I try, they have some feedback, some remark about why it's not functioning. Um, so it was quite confrontational for them as well. So we've had up to 80 participants in the, in the last two years, so 40 a year. Study success was about 70%, which is to be expected from a fully online program because people drop out, you know, they don't find the time to take, put in the hours that, that is needed. They did mention it to us. They didn't just disappear. They called the, you know, the program director or the tutors and say, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't have the time. I don't, it's not that I don't appreciate what you're doing, but I just don't have the time. So there's no really you know, disappearing students, they just mentioned to us that they weren't able to continue. Um, the ICT coordinator group, we invited them to participate in focus groups and surveys, but no one responded. I'm not sure why. Maybe it was because they had this individual program. Um, so the tutors mentioned that the ones that have given feedback were quite positive, but we don't know. Whereas the other group, the edu educational technologists, we had a focus group and a survey. You know, just not a high level of response, but they were quite satisfied. And they used the word of mouth also to attract new students. Um, they were quite satisfied because of the online course design, saying that the assignments were close enough to their actual day-to-day -day job that they could have, you know, sensible feedback and sensible learning as takeaway. Um, even the theoretical models where we were kind of, you know, do we want to inundate them with the theoretical models? They were quite happy about that because it allowed them to take a bit of distance from their daily practice and look at what the theory says about, or what research says about what they were doing. They were quite pleased with the coaches, especially, you know, fast replies to any questions or issues that they had. Um, even though it was purely online, they felt as a group at the, at the end of the year. And some of them even went on to go to uh, educational learning conferences in Flanders, met each other and, you know, interacted like friends, as it were. That's what they gave us. That's what they gave back to the, the focus group. 
they would be interested in refresher sessions or webinars about current topics. There you go again, generative AI. Um, just to know what they have to do with it. Do they need to do anything with it in secondary education or just forget about it? That's the kind of answers that they're looking for. And they would appreciate an annual networking event, but we're not sure whether they would actually come because they're from all over the country and also from the Netherlands. So taking four or five hours to drive somewhere for a three hour meeting, I'm not sure whether it would work, but we can investigate. So conclusions, both approaches have a fairly high dropout rate. Um, it's quite stressful, but also quite successful for those who can continue on, those who persevere, find that, you know, they have something out of that year that they spend on it. Um, participant satisfaction is high for the one group we don't know about the other group, um, which makes it quite hard to com compare the two learning designs. In my view, the group design worked because I was the one that started that, but the, the, the participants also gave back that it worked. We don't know about the individual program. Um, if I look at the year that's starting now, there's about 15 people enrolled for the group session, but there's only one person enrolled for the individual one. I'm not sure whether that says anything. You don't know. Um, people have, I know there's a teacher shortage in Flanders, so they don't have the time to invest in professional development, especially since it's become more expensive. Um, and then the question we have to ask ourselves as an institution, is this a program that we can sustain financially? Um, because if we only have 15 participants a year, that's just break even. But if it's less than that, then we need to stop offering that. So my conclusion is that time will tell if either of these approaches will continue to be successful. Um, I'm hoping against hope maybe that we can attract students again, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. But these are my co-authors. This was a project co-financed by the European Union. I know Britain is no longer part of it, but we still get money from the European Union, luckily. And this was funding based on the COVID pandemic. So, and these are some references if you would be interested. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for you, the comparison between two different approaches. So it takes a very interesting topic. So any questions? Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, the workload is quite high, right? Mm -hmm. Art, and, and this seems to have to do with the drop out rates. Are there any plans to reduce this in the future? Do you have any indications that some courses might be less useful that you're thinking of maybe um, scrapping or getting out of the um, the thing is, we can only get financing if we have 20 credits a year. Um, if it's less than that, we can't get any financing. Um, so we have to balance between, I, I've, I worked at the Open University in the Netherlands before, where we had this opportunity to spread out, and we noticed that the dropout rate didn't change very much, whether there was more spread or less spread. So it's more, the more you spread it, the, the less the motivation will be to continue because then you spread over two years instead of one year. So we're not really looking into spreading it for a number of reasons, but it's a, it's a very good question. Thanks. Yes? I wanted to just mention just in terms of your drop out rates mm -hmm. and how you can keep the data, we were sitting with questions to whether this is something that continues to move forward. I think those two go hand in hand in the sense that it's not it's disappointing to get not surprised no. about the dropout rates because within the profession there's so much change happening especially within technology and that's not being embedded into education and i think hand in hand i mean maybe you're sitting with this method i think you're sitting at, at, at a point of, of change mm -hmm. in the sense that i think a lot of institutions are going to come to the realization in the very near future that more technologists are needed on various different disciplines. Yep. And when that cusp happens, I think you're going to realize what you've done here is going to very much be worthwhile moving forward. Mm -hmm. For two reasons. One, technologists are going to have more time to, 
to donate to um, mm -hmm. self improvement, and you probably also want to give them more money because they tend to be more technologists as well. I think it's going to, I, I do think I can accelerate it. Um, the realization of institutions of important technology and preparing the for further more. And we see it's not an industry here in Britain, such as the NHS and things like that, that have to prepare for um, unforeseen circumstances. Um, but I will personally, I'll, I'd say definitely trying, trying to be the learning, but it's, it's definitely something that's needed. I think what we're facing in, in Flanders, especially, is the teacher shortage. So if a teacher has a background, any background, I mean, it doesn't really matter. And he normally spends 10 hours a week working on technology. He's now asked to teach French or mathematics because there's no one available. So that's the thing we have to deal with. Those schools that are really, really looking for teachers to do the, the real teaching stuff that they ask them, you know, please don't spend any time on professional development this year because we need you to teach French or mathematics or whatever. And that's that's the point we, where we are. And we're not, it seems that it will take at least five more years, this teacher shortage. But still, we need to offer this kind of program because they, the participants also said, you know, we need this to be able to function. We need the background to do our job. But the job now is teaching French instead of working in the technology. So that's a, that's a harsh context we work in. Is there, is there a new question around how the so are they, are they taking a, 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 an adjustment in the view or is this something that needs to be promoted more through funding? Or? Well, the funding was one-shot funding based on the COVID pandemic given to the, the Flemish Department of Education. So the the rules weren't set by the European Commission. The U rules were set by the Flemish community. And the Flemish Department of Education said, you know, this is the funding that you can get. And there's no change going there. We're already really pleased that they've decided, you know, to fund educational technologists since two years. That was unthinkable three years ago. You know, that was just one grandfather of one of the kids coming in to school and tinkering with iPads and laptops. And, and that's still the case in many primary schools. So the thing, the idea that the Flemish community has decided this is something that we want to recognize as you know a professional function that needs professional development is was unthinkable five years ago. So we're quite pleased with that. But then, yeah, then the teacher shortage happened. So, but thanks for the question. Yes. Um, experience <laughs> in my case I've, I've done a similar group setting um, professional development about 15 years ago and noted that that was really successful at the time it was already online um, we started with a face-to-face -face meeting then had six or eight weeks of courses and then another face-to-face -face meeting and the people who participated in that it was about 200 they were all very satisfied with that and then I moved to the Open University and noted that those courses where there is group work happening were kind of motivating for the students as well. Those that were relying only on the individual work. If you are faced with job uh, demands, family demands, and there's no one around you, no social network to pressure you into participating, then it's very easy to say, okay, I'll drop out. And so we decided also that the teachers we had are in higher education and have very, they have experience in secondary and basic education, but the most experience was within the group of students. And so we felt that in order for them to get the most out of the experience was to share that expertise amongst themselves. Um, whereas the other designers felt that, you know, they need to be able to put together a network. They need to be able to you know, open up a computer and decide which part of it is malfunctioning. So they focus really on the individual competences more than the group. So that was, you know, two different philosophical views of what good professional development should look like. It was, that's an answer. If that's... Okay. okay, so any other questions? We have one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, if somebody else, I've already asked the question before, so I'm going to say that.
Okay. Um, uh, what's the picture when it comes to um, digital capabilities development with general <laughs> teaching education? With this, the whole role of a uh, nice uh, an educated technologist feels like a sort of transitional step. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of wonder what's happening with the rest of the. Okay. Um, European Commission has. I think it was eight years ago, developed a framework called Digital Competence Education, Big Company U. And that's the framework that the Flemish community has decided to, be, that's just the framework that all teachers in Flanders will have to adhere to in the future. So if, that, if that's an answer. So we're, we're looking at this European framework, digital competences in education, uh, as the set of competences that all teachers should. And so, I was in the teacher training department for secondary education, and all our students will now have to look into this competence framework and um, see where they are and what competences they need to work on. So that's the general framework that we're functioning within. This is specifically, as you say, for ICT support. Yeah. Great. Okay. 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 Thank you very Thank much. You. To follow our, our speakers. Okay. So I now we go to the session. Okay, thank you very much for all of the participants in the session. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.